2022 will be remembered as the year of the price shock, leading to one of the worst declines in global bond markets on record. There are, however, now mounting signs that the worst of the inflation shock might be behind us. But is that because we're now headed towards a growth shock? That's the 150th episode of The Big Conversation. They are the ones that don't go out. <laughs> Although the US equity market has spent most of 2022 in a downtrend, it has remained an orderly decline, with very few of the high volume capitulation lows that have typically punctuated previous classic bear markets. If anything, we've seen the unusual activity in the counter cyclical rallies led by high volumes of very short dated options, often with less than a day to expiry. Market participants have become impatient, having become used to the very short-term capitulation events that were experienced during the Volmageddon event of early 2018, the Fed-induced sell-off at the end of the same year, and of course, the COVID shock in 2020. People have been looking for a quick buck on the way down, and then a rapid rebound. But this year has been fundamentally different from those experiences. The downtrend has lasted for most of this year, and we've still not seen a classic glow. There are many reasons for this, and amongst them are sequencing and sentiment. In terms of sequencing, the price shock has created a clear response from the professional community. Whilst there was much debate about the potential for inflation to be either transitory or sticky, the magnitude of the price shock meant that many investors became very cautious very quickly. Rate expectations increased and yields rose sharply. Based on the experience of late 2018, when yields were rising during the last rate hiking cycle, professional investors had expected the equity markets to fall. As a result, many of them bought put protection in anticipation of the Fed's policy response. But this was never panic buying of options. This preemptive buying of options meant that when the equity market did fall, investors were able to take profits on their put protection. And this selling of puts meant that many fund managers were placing a bid in the market whilst also helping to keep a lid on volatility because the selling of puts supplied volatility to the dealers. Volatility of volatility has generally been declining this year compared to rising during the other major sell-offs in the last five years. Most of the short-term lows this time around have been relatively sedate affairs. In recent weeks, short-dated options have further fueled the rallies. When put options have been bought and then the market has moved lower, short-term traders have been quick to sell those puts before the paper profits evaporate. And that has helped drive a number of sharp rallies off the short-term lows, which have then been chased higher by short-dated call buying. But we can see from open interest, however, that most of these positions are only being traded intraday. Open interest has not been exceptional, suggesting that these positions are not being bought and then held. This also implies that some of the extreme intraday put-call ratios that are usually a contrarian indicator for sentiment may now have little value because they're not reflecting a view on the long-term market, but a view on short-term intraday opportunities. And although the Fed has now taken up the challenge of higher prices and committed to a higher for longer outlook on rates, these mini shocks from the Fed have been spread out over the whole year. The market may have been looking for a pivot like those that were seen in the 1970s, but the market is now increasingly settling for a pause and perhaps a plateau in which rates stay elevated for an extended period of time. If higher inflation and higher interest rates have already caused significant damage to asset prices, then it's unlikely that the Fed will now step back before their job on inflation is properly done. So what does that mean for 2023? Can we shift from a price shock to a plateau in interest rates without creating a significant slowdown in the economy? Or does the Fed need to create a downturn in the economy to be sure that they have properly capped inflation? Well, they have said that it's easier to put back together a broken market than it is to put inflation genies back in the bottle once they've escaped. And there are clear signs globally that commodity price inflation has turned. The year-on-year -year change in the Refinitiv Commodity Index has reversed most of the prior gains. Brent crude futures are 30% below the intermediate spike of 2022. In the US, domestic commodities such as lumber have also fallen precipitously, whilst the NAHB Housing Index 
has been dropping at the same rate that it fell during the GFC and COVID crisis. Even in Europe, where many measures of producer price indexes were soaring, look like they have now turned. German PPI has dropped from 46% year on year to under 35%. And the month on month decline in German PPI of 4.2% was the biggest decline on record. And global shipping and freight prices have been dropping for a lengthy period of time. So can prices drop independently and quickly enough for policymakers to ease off on their hiking commitments? Or are prices dropping because the inflation shock has already led to a growth shock that's going to play out in 2023? Well, there have been some clues in the US yield curve. The spread between the US 10-year and the two-year yield has reached a new low, having inverted by over 70 points. This has once again highlighted the relationship between inverted yield curves and recession. Over the last 30 years, the yield curve has inverted before a recession, but it has also started to re-steepen into positive territory before the recession started. This inversion and then a re-steepen into a recession has historically taken between 9 and 30 months. But this has always taken place during the period of moderation, in which rates were raised to combat an expansion in growth, not a rise in inflation. If we go back to the late 1970s and early 1980s, we see a different picture. Although the causes of inflation may be very different today, the policy response may not. Today's two-year, 10-year inversion is the deepest since that period. Policymakers raised interest rates until they got a handle on inflation in the past. Either rampant inflation or a rapid policy response eventually capped price by breaking the economy, usually via higher unemployment. The long end of the government yield curve takes note by dropping below the yields at the front end, therefore creating a deeper inversion. Policymakers maintain their hawkish stance. Growth and therefore longer dated yields fall more, and this can happen right into the teeth of a recession, as it did at the end of the 1970s. So how far will the Fed go this time? Well, the current conundrum is the labour market. Now, anecdotally, there are signs that it is downshifting, with significant job losses across many of the large cap tech names. But at this stage, we've not seen the sort of pickup in initial jobless claims that usually preceded a historic recession. The recession has usually occurred when claims are clearly on the rise. Even with lags and revisions, that could still be months away at the moment. But will the Fed want to take a chance and hope that inflation can drop rapidly back towards interest rates? Well, historically, the Fed has taken policy rates above the level of core CPI. Given that the time it takes for CPI to drop back to 2% once it has exceeded 5% can be four years or longer, and the Fed may not be prepared to wait and see. They may feel it is better to generate some weakness in employment now rather than let the wage rises take hold that are currently being negotiated in many of the public and old economy sectors, which then may require an even more draconian response further down the road. And Given the level of financialization in the US economy, where the performance of the equity market has often defined the level of employment, pay and capex, the Fed may feel they have to see further weakness in the stock market before they really feel that the economy is under control. And as we've shown before, recessions are usually defined by rising unemployment and major lows in the equity market. If unemployment and a recession are still ahead of us, then the equity market lows probably are as well. Does that mean we're going to have a period of transition in market leadership? Well, so far, the US sell-off has primarily been tech-related, based on the inverse relationship between high yields and growth stocks. And another reason why the equity market has been relatively well-behaved is because we've seen primarily rotations from tech to value, rather than outright liquidations. Liquidations tend to be indiscriminate and occur during recessions, amidst the fear of job losses, and declining earnings. Well, if long-dated bond yields start to fall, should tech stocks start to rise? Well, I think that would be unlikely unless we're in the recovery phase where yields are finding a base, because in that scenario, the growth scare is receding. Tech may outperform, but a true recessionary slowdown with job losses should see the majority of equities struggle. But some of the biggest risk in 2023 may be amongst the relative winners of 2022, 
because it's the old world and value stocks that will be the last to get hit. Now, the long-term outlook for sectors like energy and resources is still very promising because of their massive underinvestment over the last decade and the uncertainty of the green transition. And they have relatively cheap valuations. But in the shorter term, they could come under pressure because investment plans get shelved during a genuine slowdown. And the US Energy ETF, the XLE, is at the levels that have been seen at major resistances on previous occasions. Some investors may be looking at taking profits and replacing long positions with call options to lock in some of the big gains off the COVID lows. And in Europe, the basic resources sector look like a head and shoulders top is forming. There is still some way to go, but the 520 level is a line in the sand that investors should have on their radar. A break of this level would suggest that global growth is under significant pressure. And the European industrial goods and services sector has been in a very distinct uptrend versus the broad-based stock 600 market. If global growth falters, then this trend should be breached. Also, the UK's benchmark index, the FTSE 100, is a global defensive and remains only marginally off its all-time highs. This is the sort of index that could be one of the last shoes to drop. Energy and materials make up about 25% of the index. And this index benefits from a weaker pound because of its overseas earnings. Therefore, if we get a US dollar rally during a global slowdown, the UK could still outperform, but there will still be downside risks in absolute terms. And one of the biggest questions is where the bond yields have peaked. The deeper inversion of the US two-year, 10-year curve suggests that the long end is now starting to price for a weaker growth outlook. If the Fed remains more aggressive and raises rates even further than anticipated, which would be beyond the current 5% level that is priced by the May 2023 Fed Fund's future, then the outlook for growth will be compromised further and the risk that longer dated yields move into a deeper inversion versus their short dated equivalents. And the risk to this view on yields is if the Fed chooses to pause much earlier than expected and the market sees this as supportive of inflation. If the Fed stance eases, then inflation expectations may rise and push longer dated yields higher. But it's unlikely that the Fed would allow this to happen for long. In fact, if longer dated yields rise too much, they put more pressure on US mortgages and the housing market, increasing the potential for a deeper slowdown later on. In terms of currencies, the yen may well have a decent run, even if we get a broad-based risk-off move higher in the US dollar against most other currencies. And this potential strength in the yen is because the major pressure on the yen has been their yield curve control policy and rising domestic inflation. A drop in global yields would remove this pressure and a global slowdown would reduce domestic inflation. Energy prices would also fall if there is a slowdown and this would reduce Japan's import bill. So to summarize, at the moment, the US and the global economy appears to be in transition. The price shock this year has led to an economic slowdown, but not a true recession, except where energy costs have spiraled out of control. Inflation appears to have peaked, but policymakers will want to make sure that it's permanent and not just an intermediate peak. And to make sure of that, the Fed will still want to see a pickup in unemployment. And that might require more pain in the equity market to force the hand of boardrooms. So far, the equity market has had an orderly decline focused on tech. But if we shift towards a growth shock, then the winners of the rotation in 2022 could also come under pressure because the selling generally becomes more indiscriminate during a true recession. But a recession is not yet baked in the cake. A strong contrarian view is building that a recession won't occur. But that might actually be the biggest fear for a Fed that is determined to focus on inflation and price so that they can eventually create a sustainable path towards true growth. In the next section, we're going to delve further into this very discussion between the price shock of 2022 and the potential growth shock of 2023. And I'm going to speak to Lizanne Saunders, the chief investment strategist at Charles Schwab, about what the Fed should be thinking and what the Fed should be doing. Hi, Lizanne, and welcome. And uh, I think I wanted to chat to you because we're at this very interesting juncture at the moment where 2022 has felt a little bit like a price shock, but not yet a true kind of broad-based recession. But it feels like we might be now in a transitions phase 
coming in towards 2023, where some of this tightening might start to feed through to the real economy. What I wanted to sort of get your views on is, um, what do you think the Fed or what is it that the Fed should be doing right now? And what is it that they are doing? So I think for the most part, they're doing the right thing. There's lots of debates and debates will probably go on for for years and years about whether uh, the Fed was was late to the inflation fighting party. But that's all the counterfactual. There's nothing we can do about what they did or didn't do in the past at this stage in the game. They want to maintain an aggressive stance until they have convincing evidence that inflation has not just peaked and started to come down, but is on its way down sustainably. So for now, anyway, that keeps them on a fairly aggressive uh, tightening path, maybe with a, an expected step down in the pace. And I would expect that to continue maybe up until the point where you start to see the kind of deterioration in the labor market that to some degree is a feature of what they're trying to do in terms of bringing inflation down sustainably. And when you talk about that, you sort of say, well, they may um, step back from, I suppose, 75 to maybe 50. But this comes to this great debate that everybody's sort of having, which is they're going to pivot. Now, what do you, what do you think the market thinks a pivot is? Because I always used to think of a pivot as being reverse engines and cut rates, but it's not really that anymore, is it? Well, I think that's what was uh, defined as as a pivot back in mid-June when you saw the, the big stock market rally that ensued over the couple of months until to mid-August. Um, personally, I thought that narrative made little to no sense because at that point, we weren't at a peak in inflation. And I think the only condition or set of conditions that would be a green light for the Fed to pivot to rate cuts would be much more deterioration broadly in the economy or at least in the labor market, which is why I think that the Fed is still trying to maybe define the difference between a pause, just pulling their foot off the brake, not to then pivot to rate cuts, but to just assess the landscape, knowing full well that there's lags in terms of monetary policy changes and an impact it has on the broader macro economy as well as on the labor market. So a pause is in the cards, but I still think a pivot is not in the cards until that combination of much weaker economic growth, more deterioration in the labor market in conjunction with further, uh, you know, move down in the inflation data. And I, I think the Fed is likely once they get to the terminal rate and pause, wh whatever that is, I think their their inclination is to stay there for a while. So I think a, a pivot may not be a 2023 story. And so when you, when you think of that, that pause, and you're effectively talking a plateau, and at the moment, I think Fed funds is still really got quite a distinct pivot in sort of May of 2023. Is it going to be a plateau or is it one of these things where they might pause and if things don't go their way, they could actually then continue on the path to potentially um, tighter rates if things aren't going in the right direction? The way I think about it is almost with some kind of mirror image um, symmetry or asymmetry is if the Fed overshoots, let's say, you know, with eventually with the benefit of hindsight, they, they end up tightening too much, more than was necessary to bring inflation uh, down. And in turn, that causes more of an economic dislocation, disruption, more deterioration in the labor market than either was their goal or, or their hope. That actually would set up the possibility of rate cuts coming sooner, not later. So more front and weakness sets up a nearer term pivot. Conversely, if the Fed undershoots and they pause too quickly, and for whatever reason you get a reignition of inflation and they have to either step back in, that pushes the eventual pivot to rate cuts out into the future. I'm not sure that there really is a perfect <laughs> scenario where they get it just right in terms of policy. It's just right in terms of inflation continuing to come down with no impact on the labor market. That's always a, a, a very narrow hole in the needle that the Fed tries to thread. I think maybe even narrower given the very unique circumstances in this environment, not least being they're battling a 40-year high in inflation. They're not battling the prospect of inflation. 
So it's, it's, I mean, it is a real tightrope that they're walking. And as, as you say, it sort of sounds like it's the, the choice between a little bit of relief now, but if you really want sustainable growth, you have to actually you know, cap wanton for all prices today. But in terms of the, the sort of the mechanism that gets that, that sort of the prices properly down, is it that they need to break employment, as in push employment significantly higher? Or do they need to break the equity market because of financialization that would lead to job losses? Or is it effectively one or the other or both because they're sort of two sides of the same coin? I think it's a combination of both. And 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 frankly, on the on the equity market breaking side of, of things, as well as breakage outside the traditional financial system or equity market and some of the more speculative areas of the market. The the most recent obvious example is what's going on with FTX and, and crypto. That's, I don't want to say already happened as if it's fully in the rearview mirror, but that is having um, the intended effect until recently because the rally has aided in loosening financial conditions. But that's been a driver of the tighter financial conditions the Fed wants and believes is necessary to bring inflation down. On the labor market front, Again, they would love the, the the Goldilocks or perfect scenario of essentially squashing job openings, bringing down the quits rate without it leading to a significant move higher in the unemployment rate. That's where it becomes really uh, tricky. And I still think that given the, the uh, call it brown shoots of labor market weakening that you actually already see if you bother to look under the hood of standard measures like payrolls or the unemployment rate, we're starting to see some of those breaks. Whether the Fed can help to engineer that perfect scenario of taking the tightness out of the labor market without causing a significant increase in the unemployment rate, I think that's a much tougher exercise. I I think the unemployment rate is going higher from here. Maybe not to an extreme degree because there's still that desire for companies to hang on to you know, that sort of hard fought, hard won labor. But to expect the unemployment rate to stay at these very suppressed levels, I think that that's that's a bit pie in the sky in terms of a hope. And how do you think that the Fed is actually viewing the um, that employment outlook? You talked about the quits, etc. It feels very different from what it was in the 1970s, very unionized. And yet, underneath the surface, you know, if we look at the job market, obviously, we're seeing some of the sort of tech companies shedding jobs. But we are seeing effectively inflation beating wage negotiations coming through in parts of the public sector and certainly some of the old economy. Do you think the Fed has still got that kind of Pavlovian conditioning from yesteryear in the 1970s that if they don't break the labour market, there is this risk that wages do become a spiral like the 1970s, even though a lot of the reasons behind today's higher prices are very, very different from then? So I, I obviously can't get it directly inside the head of Powell or other Fed members. I, I do think that the Fed, definitely Powell, he's a student of history, he's a very smart guy. I think he understands that there are more differences between the current environment in 1970s than there are similarities in terms of what the drivers of inflation are, how systemic they are. You mentioned organized labor and unionization, but you can go into globalization and demographics as being very distinctly uh, different. Um, what I think they're really trying to to do as it relates to the environment of the 1970s is avoid the fits and starts of monetary policy that led to two or three times where inflation reignited again, ultimately requiring, as I like to say, Volcker, Paul Volcker, to pull a Volcker. So it's not so much that they 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 view the conditions in a Pavlovian way as as similar, but they want to avoid the st- the starts and stops mistake that helped keep inflation uh, entrenched. So I think that's the important reference to the 1970s, not the background conditions. And and you talked about there's this sort of, there's this narrow window where potentially things might go just right, which is if we see inflation coming down quickly enough before we see weight, before we see unemployment really, really picking up. Um, Do you think that the, the barn door is already flapping open because of the sort of lagged effect of what we've seen in terms of higher interest rates, and particularly, you know, we've got these mortgage rates, which are, it's not so much that they're super high, it's just they've come from very, very low levels to relatively high mm-hmm. levels. And that's if you're talking about interest rates and yields that sound like they're probably going to stay slightly higher than expected and slightly higher than people had expected. Does that mean that it's going to be very, very hard to avoid 
some form of recession. But do you think that we could avoid a deep recession? At this point, with the the data we all have at hand, I, I think the avoidance of a deep recession is is more than possible. It's probably the more likely scenario because we don't have the kind of financial system imbalances akin to, say, the 2008 period, where then when housing faltered or imploded, it took the entire global financial system down with it. That is not uh, the case right now. But although i'm i'm a big believer that rate of change in in most data in terms of economic data and how it relates to the stock market rate of change and direction matters probably more than level i i've always said you know better or worse matters more than good or bad but in the case of interest rates um i think level has to be taken into consideration too and that's where some of the lagged effects come into play yes we've already seen it in the housing market because of the spike in mortgage rates. But when you think about the 0% interest rate environment, negative interest rate environment that's been so pervasive around the globe, not just in the United States, it was a breeding ground for lots of kind of funky things, including lack of price discovery, the the keeping of zombie companies uh, afloat, uh, the ample liquidity uh, that then moved a lot of money outside of areas typically offering that liquidity. And I don't think we have yet finish the process of of going through that, you know, as the liquidity tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. So I, I think whether it's in the, the the private, you know, bank market, the the credit markets, zombie companies and the ability to remain afloat uh, because of interest costs, that's where I think the level is already and will continue to come into play, not just the rate of change. And sort of thinking of slightly beyond 2023, but how this plays out, do you see this as being effectively, I don't want to say transitory because I mean, that, that's that horrible debate and it's kind of largely irrelevant, but do you see this as being something which is a reset to a new regime and a new framework, which is interest rates are going to set higher and we potentially have slightly higher levels of base inflation than we've had before? Or do you see this as being something which was a, a breakage in the system, a bit like we had post 19, well, in the 1940s post-war, where Things got out of line, but eventually after four or five years, they got back into line and things started to normalize again. Do you think that we are on potentially a new multi-decade framework or do you think that this is just an unusual experience because of COVID and then because of other um, issues and a little bit of malinvestment maybe over the last 10 years? But once this has worked its way through and those cycles of realign, we'll move back to something like before or is it completely different now? No. I, I think it is uh, quite a bit different. I don't think we go back to the environment that preceded the pandemic, the two decades or so often defined as the period of great moderation. Uh, I don't think that is in any way the condition we're going back to. Now, it is certainly possible that on the way down, components of inflation could overshoot on the downside, and you're already seeing disinflation, if not even a little deflation in certain segments that overshot on the upside. But I think ultimately when inflation settles, it probably not only settles at a higher level than was the case during the great moderation, but it probably comes with more ongoing volatility. Uh, as a result, I don't. I think they pretty much gone for now and maybe for some time is the era of 0% interest rates and multi-trillion dollar balance sheets on the part of the Fed. That's not a bad thing in the sense that we actually have a risk-free rate now. There's income and fixed income. Um, I think there's greater price discovery. There's a reconnectivity of, of fundamentals and, and prices. I, I think it's actually to the benefit of the average stock versus you know the market having been so cap weight oriented. Um, I think it's a benefit in terms of an eventual positive capital spending cycle. So it's going to be quite different, but not all bad um, relative to what was the case before. I think capital might lose a little bit of the weight or power as in GDP with a pickup a bit in terms of labor's weight and power. I don't say that with a political bent to it. That's just the way cycles work. It has to do with demographics and lots of other things going on globally, not just in the United States. So I think there, there are a lot of interesting and important, more secular shifts that I think we're going through the process of of getting to that, uh, again, are, are some of them, I, I think, bring some some sunshine <laughs> into the mix. And so just sort of finishing off, in terms of what we should think about this sort of investment environment going forward, 
it sounds like this is going to be an environment where um, effectively there's going to be more opportunity, more dispersion, because we've been used to sort of tech, 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 big cap getting mega right. cap and sort of flows being very, very channeled. It sounds like capital will have more opportunities, maybe smaller opportunities, but more opportunities and a greater dispersion of opportunities. And a reconnection between fundamentals and uh, prices. Um, analysis really didn't have to go very deep in a world where passive was so dominant and you had these cap-weighted indexes driven primarily by a small handful of stocks. Decision-making was fairly easy, particularly if, if you were benchmark-oriented. Um, and maybe it becomes a little less easy if you're not in a you know permeable market where you just put all your money in an S&P index fund or ETF and you know, ride to the moon, but I do think it provides an opportunity for differentiation, for active to be living on a more or playing on a more level playing field with uh, with passive. And um, the fact that you have this reconnection between fundamentals and uh, prices across lots of asset classes, not just specifically uh, the equity market. I think we're in some version of a rolling recession, and I think there's probably more pockets to come that will be hit, but there have been positive offsets along the way. And so to me, that's best case scenario is this just continues without the bottom falling out all at once. I view that the rolling recession scenario as more the best case scenario versus the typical language of a soft landing. So as you can see, there are a lot of moving parts at the moment. But I thought what was really interesting is Lizanne's view that we might be having a rolling recession where different parts of the economy are experiencing recessions at different times and in different magnitudes. And this means that next year might have as many opportunities as there are concerns and fears of a new low in the bear market. And that's because we're going to see different phases of recovery at the same time that we'll see different phases of recession. So next year, there's all to play for. The key will be whether we've seen a peak in bond yields or not. But also, I think the key here is the Fed still wants to maintain a cap on price. And that means that that inverted V pivot that many people still expect may not materialize. And we have to start factoring in much more of a plateau in interest rates throughout 2023.